Now we are turning, as you have already heard this evening, to the second chapter of the book of the prophet Jonah. I've had the privilege of occupying this pulpit from time to time now for almost a quarter of a century, and uh, I have been doing that long enough, one would have thought, to have learned the lesson that last Sunday night I should be preaching from Jonah chapter 2 instead of Jonah chapter 1. So if on these occasions when we are not engaged in a series, you discover that there is a consistent pattern in the passages that I select for preaching, and it's always chapter 2 and not chapter 1, then uh, you will recognize that slow learner as I am, I have at last learned my lesson. But I'm glad to be turning uh, our attention together to this second chapter of the book of Jonah, because as we followed the storyline of this wonderful prophecy last Sunday evening, we left Jonah, one might say, in the Mediterranean, in the belly of the great fish. And that is never a wise place to leave a prophet of God. What we were doing, however, was exploring the theme that begins to unfold itself in the opening chapter of Jonah's biography, and that is the theme of personal spiritual decline. And I drew your attention, those of you who were here last Sunday, to this theme because it is, I think, a theme of enormous importance for us in the times in which we are living and I hope that to some degree as we began to unfold some of the characteristic marks of spiritual decline and some of the manifestations of that decline, many of which we noticed in this first chapter of the book of Jonah, I hope you felt that this is a word from God that speaks to the times in which we are living, speaks to the church to which we belong, but most of all speaks in a pointed way to ourselves. In particular, we noticed that the two great hallmarks of spiritual decline seen in the experience of Jonah and invariably observable in all spiritual decline is that on the first place, Jonah turned his heart from the Word of God. And in the second place, Jonah turned his life, or sought to turn his life, from the presence of God. And these two things, a turning away from God's Word and a turning away from God's presence, as we began to see them unfold in the tragedy of Jonah's spiritual decline, were the evidences of the fact that he had built for himself as a child of God and a servant of God a kind of spiritual comfort zone of personal obedience. That is to say, there were large areas of his life in which he was prepared to be obedient to God. And it seems almost as though within those boundary markers, his life had never really been tested. And so he was regarded in his own day and afterwards as a servant of God whose ministry had abounded in fruitfulness. And that indeed was the truth of the matter. He was a fruitful servant of God. And yet a fruitful servant of God who had not yet been brought to the place where his spiritual comfort boundaries had been seriously tested. And then, without warning, certainly without anticipation on Jonah's part, God broke down or sought to break down those boundary markers that Jonah unconsciously had set for himself broke within the boundaries of the level of obedience with which Jonah was personally comfortable and demanded from him an obedience and a service which made Jonah feel distinctly uncomfortable. 
And it was in this context, of course, that layers, levels of spiritual resistance began to manifest themselves. Whereas Jonah had presumed himself to be an obedient servant of God, how could he ever have ministered in public without that presupposition? He was beginning to discover that there were hidden layers of resistance to what God wanted from his life. And instead of responding to the way in which God was unfolding to him in this dynamic way, the new depths of obedience to which he was calling him, Jonah resisted to the very depths of his being. He refused God. And there is a sense in which the story makes it obvious he would rather have died than being submissive to God when God spoke to him through his word and pursued him with the majesty of his presence. Thus far, said Jonah, but no further. And the tragedy of that, of course, is that when we say thus far and no further to the Lord, It isn't just those areas in which we manifestly refuse him that our life begins to fall to pieces spiritually. It's everywhere that our life begins to fall to pieces, not only in the new areas of obedience and consecration to which he summons us, but also in the very areas in which we previously assumed that we were altogether obedient. And so we found Jonah unable in a time of crisis to do what he assumed he would always be able to do, namely to speak forth the word of God. He who had been so presumably, presumably confident in God's mercy in his ministry as a prophet among God's people now discovered himself as we see in response to the sailor's questions the pointed one which he refrains from answering being, what do you do? And he gives us in this biographical account a little indication that it wasn't simply in the matter of his disobedience of God telling him to go and preach the gospel in Nineveh. It was at the very root and center of his being that touched the whole of his spiritual service that this spiritual declension had set in. And so that disobedience spread to the whole of his life. Now if the first chapter of the book of Jonah is this kind of analysis of what is involved for a servant of God, for a child of God, in spiritual decline, Then the second chapter, which is constituted by this great prayer of Jonah, is a chapter that describes for us what begins to happen in the life of a man or a woman who by God's grace and mercy is lifted up from that spiritual decline and begins to experience spiritual awakening, spiritual renewal, spiritual revival. And in that sense, the wonder of what God is doing in Jonah's life, which he is as yet unaware of, as God pursues him with the wind, as God brings this great fish to receive him when he is thrown into the Mediterranean. What God is doing in pursuing Jonah is pursuing him in order that he may quicken, restore, revive, and use him once again to a much deeper degree than he had ever done before in the great awakening that will take place when Jonah eventually is obedient and listens to the voice of God and goes to preach in Nineveh. And in that sense, John Calvin is quite right in his lectures on the prophecy of Jonah when he says that this great fish which God had prepared for him became a kind of hospital in which Jonah was healed and revived and sent again, strengthened in spiritual service. 
The interesting thing to me is that just as the opening chapter gives us the hallmarks of spiritual decline, the prayer in the second chapter provides for us similar hallmarks and characteristics of spiritual renewal and spiritual revival. It provides for us what we might call, recalling the title of a book by Jonathan Edwards, the great American revivalist. It provides for us a description of the distinguishing marks of a work of the Spirit of God. And in that sense is intended to evoke from us ourselves the cry, then revive us again, O Lord, in the midst of the years. In your wrath, remember mercy. And I want us to look together at five of these marks, all of which I would dare to say are the invariable marks and as well as tests the invariable marks of an individual who is living in a condition of spiritual awakening and renewal and revival. And they are most important for us not only to understand that we may long for them in our own lives, but they are important for us to understand in order that we may begin to see them in our fellowship together that we too may be a revived people, a renewed people. And wherever you go in the history of the Christian church, whenever God has awakened a Christian believer, an individual Christian believer, or a whole company of Christian believers, these five marks are always present. Without them, there is no spiritual awakening. With them, spiritual awakening is inevitable. Now, what are they? The first of them, and doubtless the key, is that Jonah found himself humbled under the hand of God. That is to say, he not only felt himself physically to be in danger, as he describes in verses 5 and 6, the engulfing waters threatened me, the deep surrounded me, Seaweed was wrapped around my head. You can almost feel him going down, down, down into the Mediterranean. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. And he felt himself, as he goes on to say, caught in the pit. His life was hanging by a thread. He was in great personal, physical danger. But it's not so much the personal physical danger that concerns him. It is the fact that the personal spiritual danger was a sacrament of something else. And that was that he was being humbled. Indeed, one might even say he was being crushed. Certainly, one could say he was virtually being drowned under the mighty hand of God. And he recognizes this, you'll notice, in verses 3 and 4. As he addresses God in verse 1 as the God of the covenant, and he uses the covenant name for God. As he addresses God as the God of the covenant, what does he say? He says, in essence, this is the hand of divine chastisement upon my life. You hurled me into the deep. Beyond the hand of the sailors who threw him in, he sees the hand of God. You hurled me into the deep. All your waves and your breakers swept over me. And I said, listen, I have been banished from your sight. And this is what he is most conscious of in the midst of all the physical alarm. What he is most conscious of is a spiritual alarm. His spiritual condition is that he feels himself to have been banished from the very presence and sight of God himself. And the language is clearly here both regal and judicial. 
It was a king who had the authority to banish someone from his land. But a king would banish someone from his land and from his sight, from his court, only if there were righteous grounds for doing so. And this is what Jonah is discovering about himself. That God has every right now to banish him from his sight. To say, as it were, to the court of heavenly angels, get that Jonah who has professed to serve me, get him out of my sight. And he feels himself to be overwhelmingly crushed with a sense of God's righteous, chastising hand upon him. He had begun to feel this already, you remember, in chapter 1, verse 12, when he said to the sailors, I know it is my fault that this great storm has come upon me. What is the truth now about Jonah? The truth now about Jonah is that he finds himself utterly without excuse for his disobedience to God utterly without excuse for his disobedience to God. And something very remarkable is therefore happening to him. He is actually being brought back to the beginnings of his spiritual existence. You remember how Paul puts it very graphically in Romans 3.19 when he says, the beginning of spiritual existence is this that every mouth is closed and the whole world is held guilty before God. If I became a Christian at all in any conscious way, then that was bound to be a significant element in what happened to me. I stopped defending myself to God. My mouth was closed and I knew that he was in the right to say to me, out of my sight, banish him, banish her. But you see, that being brought back was the most significant thing that could ever have happened to Jonah. He needed to be brought back to the beginnings of his spiritual life if he was ever to be brought forward to be the instrument of God's blessing. And you see what begins to happen. What was he like before? Well, it seems that he was concerned with matters of his own personal pride and his reputation as a prophet, as we saw last Sunday evening. He was indeed full of spiritual arrogance. God came to him with his word and said to him, Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city. Its wickedness has come up against me and I want you to preach there. And Jonah, in his spiritual arrogance, believed it was possible for him to continue as a prophet of God and to say ho-hum to what God was clearly saying to him. I don't suppose if we had lived in Jonah's time, we would, we would have had the spiritual, perhaps some of us would have, but probably not many of us would have had the spiritual sensitivity as we listen to Jonah preach in those days when God's word was beginning to wrestle with his innermost being and his pride and his arrogant sense that he could continue as a servant of God with such a disobedient heart. Would we have noticed that something had gone out of Jonah's ministry? Something had gone out of his walk with God as a prophet who was able to say, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, and the Lord does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Would we have been able to say to Jonah, Jonah, you're not the man you used to be? I doubt it. We're highly unsuccessful in detecting it in others and in ourselves. I doubt we would have been able to detect it in him. But now you see, 
by God's grace he had begun to detect it in himself and that was all that mattered it didn't matter whether they noticed it back home it wouldn't matter if they noticed it in Nineveh it didn't matter any longer whether the sailors noticed it or not the only thing that was really important was that Jonah himself recognized the truth of his spiritual condition and the truth of his spiritual condition was he was no longer the man he had been when he had first come to faith in the living God and he was appalled by what he saw and in God's presence he said the fault is mine And my dear friends, that's always the preamble to spiritual awakening. It was Martin Luther, I think, who said that God created the world out of nothing and he will do nothing with you until he is in a position where you are able to say, Lord, I am nothing, but create something out of me. And there is no spiritual awakening without that. There can be spiritual pride without that, spiritual self-sufficiency without that, a sense of arrogance in the face of God's word. There can be spiritual inconsistency without that. But until we are humbled under God's mighty hand, as Peter says, and he knew something of this, didn't he? We will never know what it is in due season to be exalted so he was humbled under the hand of God the second thing that is evident of his life and these other evidences flow from the first was that he clearly thirsted for the presence of God he was humbled under the hand of God and he thirsted for the presence of God and just as in chapter 1 we saw how there is a kind of geographical version of Jonah's spiritual declension, so there is a geographical version of it here. God threw him down into the deeps, but God preserved him and brought him out from the pit. And what God was doing geographically with him, God was doing also spiritually with him verse 6 at the end you brought my life up you resurrected me you renewed me you awakened me you quickened my life from the pit O oh Lord my God and you see what began to happen because of God's grace in his life he not only felt himself to be humbled under the hand of God but he became thirsty for the presence of God and you see him in chapter 2 doing the very thing that he refused, indeed became incapable of doing in chapter 1. Even the pagan sea captain was down shaking him out of his slumber in chapter 1 and saying to him, for heaven's sake man, pray, pray, pray. And now that's the only thing he can do in chapter 2. The whole thing is a prayer. And even within the prayer, he tells us how he was praying. For example, he tells us in verse 2 that he was calling for help. He was crying to God. And again in verse 4, he says, I'm banished from your sight, yet I will look again to your holy temple. And again in verse 7, I remembered the Lord and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Now what's the significance of this? The significance of this is, of course, that the holy temple to which Jonah's prayer was arising, think of it, out of the midst of the Mediterranean Sea, his mind is fixed upon the temple of God in Jerusalem. Why? Because that's the only place in the known universe where God has promised to make his presence known 
That's one of the great differences between the Old Testament and the New Testament experience of God. We saw another of them last Lord's Day evening. Here is a most significant one. In the Old Testament days, the special presence of God was promised in Jerusalem and nowhere else. Yes, of course, God was omnipresent. There was nowhere you could go to hide from His presence. But if you wanted to meet with God and know that your sins were forgiven, the only place on earth you could go in the Old Testament day was to the temple of Jerusalem. There was not another plot of land in the entire universe where you could see an acceptable sacrifice made for your sins and see a man move through the throng from the holy place into the holiest place of all, and then emerge and pronounce the blessing of forgiveness. The Lord's face is turned towards you. The Lord's countenance is smiling upon you. The only place under heaven where your sins could be assuredly forgiven was in the temple of Jerusalem where God came and made himself known. And this is what Jonah desires. It's not just that he wants to be back in the old denomination, as it were. Back in the old Presbyterian services, because, as you know, they were Presbyterians in the Old Testament. No, no. No, no. He's thirsting for the presence of the God from whom he had been fleeing. And he is now able to say that he knows that at God's right hand there are pleasures forevermore. My friends, that's always, always one of the evidences that God is beginning to awaken his people. They hunger and thirst for more of his presence. They want to know what it is for God to come down as he does in the Old Testament and to be enthroned upon the praises of his people. They sing in that way. They sing as those who want to draw out the heart of God whom they admire to come down. They want to be full. And so they thirst for the presence of God and are desolated by the sense of his absence. But then there is a third evidence of Jonah's spiritual awakening, obviously. Humbled under the hand of God, he is thirsty for the presence of God, but he is also inevitably hungry for the Word of God. And although this is not stated, as it were, in so many words in the psalm, it is what this psalm of praise is really all about. He is hungry for God's Word. Now, what's the evidence of that? Well, the evidence of it is obvious. If you tore Jonah chapter 2 out of your Bible, not something to be recommended, and blotted out the first verse, and gave it to a fellow Christian and said, what book of the Bible does that come from? I suspect 80% of Christian believers would say, I'm not sure which one it is, but it's one of the Psalms. And here is a good exercise. If you have a good reference Bible, you'll notice in the margins that there will be references to various Psalms right through this chapter. You can go through this chapter almost syllable by syllable and discover where it is in the Psalter that Jonah is either quoting or echoing. There's scarcely a word here that's original to Jonah. Now what's that a sign of? Well, in his case, this man who had turned from God's word when he had spoken to him, it's a sign that his mind has now begun to flood with God's word. And he's holding on to God by means of his word. And he cannot get enough of God's word. He is hungry for it. Whenever an individual is spiritually awakened, that's what happens, isn't it? You just cannot get enough of God's word. Whether it be in the exposition of it, 
or whether it be in your personal reading of it, you, you are hungry for God's Word and you want to devour God's Word. You wish there were some way of getting God's Word mechanically into your brain so that you knew it immediately. And so you come to God's Word like a dog with a bone and you chew it and you chew it and you digest it and you simply cannot ever get enough of it. That's what happens whenever there is a revival, incidentally. Whenever there is a revival, do you know what people want? They want two things, by and large. They want meetings for prayer. And they want to hear the preaching of God's Word. And they want to hear more preaching of God's Word. And more preaching of God's Word. And you know another interesting thing about the revivals that have taken place in the history of the Christian church? Most of the preachers who have been involved in them have been good men, but average preachers. They have been good men, but average preachers. Yes, I know there are the Edwards and the Whitfields, but they are few and far. There are many places around the city of Glasgow where there have been good men who were moderate preachers who labored in situations that suddenly came alive with the power of God's grace and the people were crying out for them to give them more preaching. Why? Not because they loved preaching, but because they were hungry for God's word. And they weren't content simply to go home and read it. They wanted to hear it expounded in the congregations of God's people in the context of worship, even by these men who are moderate preachers. And one of the most amazing things that happens in every true spiritual revival is this, that when men and women are awakened like this, they turn moderate preachers into giants. They draw it out of them. Because they are hungry for God's Word. They want to know what God says. And they want to do it. And this is what our friend Jonah is doing as he is there in the belly of the great fish. It's as though God has, by His Spirit, opened up the dams that have blocked the memory of the Word of God that he had formerly hidden in his heart. And it comes rushing in and he just can't get enough of it. He's here and he's here and he's holding on to God here. And he's devouring the Scriptures because the Scriptures reveal God to him. The fourth great mark of his awakening is that he became a man re-consecrated to the will of God. You find this, of course, almost at the end of this psalm of praise. In verse 9, I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. And then this, what I have vowed, I will make good. What's he saying here? Well, he is referring to his great moment of consecration to the Lord. When he said, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. And he is saying now to the Lord, what I vowed when I first yielded to your summons into your covenant kingdom, what I vowed I will now make good. You see, one of the things that begins to take place in our lives when we are spiritually quickened is that we want to pursue the evidences of sin and rebellion in our lives to the death. That's what taking a vow in the Old Testament meant. It meant I will do this 
even if I die in doing it. You think of ways that could apply to your life. There are simple ways of doing this. You only need to open your Bible at the Ten Commandments and say, Lord, if I am covenanted to you in Jesus Christ, then this is the life that I have vowed to live. What I have vowed, I will make good. Now you see, the sign that I am living in a spiritually awakened condition is that I'm able to go down through the Ten Commandments and say, God helping me, what I have vowed, I will make good. What God forbids, I decisively reject. What God commands, I embrace as my only safety. And this is what Jonah is doing. In the belly of the great fish, he has been, as it were, someone who has begun to be restored. He's not perfect. The rest of the book indicates that he's not perfect. He hasn't been finally delivered from the struggles that every Christian believer, every child of God in Scripture always knows to the end of their days. But he's been revived, quickened, restored, awakened, and reconsecrated to the will of God. The fifth mark, well, of course, it's this. You'll find it at the beginning. It is that he prays to his covenant God. And being humbled under his hand, thirsting for his presence, hungering for his word, reconsecrated to his will. As he says in verse 8, he becomes concerned to see the salvation of God in the lives of others. Those who cling to worthless idols, he says. What did he thought of those who cling to worthless idols before? He couldn't care tuppence about them. That's what he thought. He would rather have his spiritual comfort zone in the Holy Land than go to Nineveh and show that he was really concerned about those who were clinging to the worthless idols of Ninevite paganism. When he was in the ship, did he care about these pagan sailors who were almost on the verge of death because of his disobedience? No, he didn't. He was fast asleep. He didn't care tuppence about them. But you see, he's now a man who has come to a new sense of his own need of salvation. He's come to be able to say, like Paul said, Lord, I'm the chief of sinners. Save me. And when that happens in an individual's life, he becomes concerned for others. Those who cling to worthless idols, listen, he says, Oh my God, they're forfeiting the grace that could be theirs. They're forfeiting the grace that could be theirs. And he's full of compassion because he knows that their only hope is if salvation comes to them from the Lord. Rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Why? Thou must save. And thou alone. And what happened? The God who had spoken to him in chapter 1, who had pursued him with the wind in chapter 1, who had sent and prepared the great fish in chapter 1, is now the God who, at the end of chapter 2, speaks again and commands the fish and it vomits Jonah onto dry land and as he picks himself up the word of the Lord comes to him a second time and now whatever God says Jonah will do God had broken through the comfort zone and dealt with the disobedience and awakened 
his servant. Oh, my dear friends, we stand in great need of these marks. In these days in which we live, we stand in desperate need of these marks in our own lives. And we need to pray to God that some measure of this, just some measure of this, may begin to become visible in us personally and in our life corporately. And then Nineveh will hear and Nineveh will repent. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we confess together the extent to which we see ourselves in Jonah and Jonah in ourselves. Revive us, we pray. Have mercy upon us and quicken us and bring us afresh, we pray, to say, the vows I have made to Jesus Christ I will make good. We pray this in his name. Amen.